well done. All right, thank you, Erin. And now we're gonna move to a different kind of unknown. I'd like to welcome to the stage Marcelo Ponton, who's also been with us on the stage since year one, right? Not true, yeah, yeah. But hasn't been here for a while, and so please help me welcome Marcelo to the stage to tell us about the unknown soldier. The prodigal son returns. Let me uh, get this up. Hold on a second. Uh, just as a side while I do this, uh, I was stationed up in uh, Greenland, and the uh, it was actually in Thule, uh, Greenland, so it actually kind of uh, coordinates with this. So I'm here to do the most literal uh, a talk here about the unknown soldier, and I think it's um, I think that this is probably very uh, uh, periodic for considering that this weekend is uh, Veterans Day and the Unknown Soldier has a very uh, strong connection to that. So, so the history of the unknown. So the idea of having a, a how do you say, honoring the fallen soldiers has been something since uh, the uh, Peloponnesian Wars and the Greek soldiers after coming home would parade with an uh, empty stretcher. And that was to signify the, uh, their, the fallen soldiers that they left behind in the fields. Uh, and then, but in, prior to the 19th century or late 19th century and 20th century, the idea of the unknown soldier uh, wasn't really a concept because it was known to leave soldiers behind on the battlefield, whether known or unknown. And so, it was, uh, and they were usually, you know, buried in mass graves or burned uh, to avoid desecration or disease and whatnot. So, so it wasn't really until the Civil War and the end of the Civil War that becoming it was becoming more recognized not what was so wrong about having unknown soldiers, and it was really because it represented those countless families that don't have closure once their soldiers died. And this is actually um, there's stories in the Civil War where soldiers actually wrote their name and their addresses on a piece of slip of paper and they would put them and they would sew them into their jackets so they wouldn't be one of those unknown soldiers that their families would know that, that they died honorably. And most of, this was pretty much kind of encompassed uh, most recently or most known is kind of in Cold Harbor, the Battle of Cold Harbor. So understanding this, uh, Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs, uh, after the war, ordered the army to gather the soldiers' remains that were scattered from the battlefields from Bull Run to Rappahannock. And in September 1866, a monument was dedicated that stands atop a masonry vault containing the remains of those 2,111 men. And due to the nature of their decomposition, it was also considered um, the, those soldiers to be and represent those soldiers on both sides of the war. But what's interesting enough about this is that these guys were buried in the Rose Garden of Arlington House the former plantation of General Robert E. Lee and his family on the orders of Meeks, who was a fellow Virginian and very spiteful for the fact that uh, Robert E. Lee joined the uh, Confederate cause. And the reason why he buried them specifically in that place was so Robert E. Lee could never actually use that house again. Um, the, interesting enough, too, is that Arlington House and that plantation ended up becoming Arlington National Cemetery. So. But it wasn't until the horrors of the trench warfare and the monumental toll it took on the lost generation of World War I that nations felt it needed to use a single tomb to memorialize the thousands of the nameless dead in the trenches, in the battlefields. So the first examples of the Tomb of the Unknowns was the grave of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. And forgive my French, I am so American. La Tomb the Tomb de Soldat in Canu, which is placed in the Arc de Triomphe, both interned on Armistice Day and November 11th, 1920, in a simultaneous service. Well, the point of the Tomb of the Unknowns, soldier, is that it contains a single unnamed remains of a soldier. And the fact that unknown to only to God is usually what's inscribed in there, and the whole point of that symbolism is that that one soldier buried in those tombs are supposed to represent all those soldiers who are unnamed who died in the service for their country. So since then, 
countries all over the world have their own tombs, including the United States. And the process for the United States in creating their own was first exhuming the remains of four different soldiers, four different anonymous American soldiers from the different battlefields of the Western Front in, in Europe. And on Memorial Day of 1921, aboard the USS Olympia, a fellow Chicagoan, Chicago, uh, Sergeant Edward F. Younger, a highly decorated sergeant, uh, non-commissioned officer, uh, pictured over here on my left, uh, he, uh, he was chosen to pick one of those four soldiers. And, and, we, and, and his decision was the man who was gonna be uh, buried in, 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 in Arlington Cemetery. So the rest were buried in uh, the Argonne Cemetery in France. So, oops. Oh, there we go. So the body laid in state for the Capitol Rotunda for a couple of months, and on Armistice Day 1921, uh, President Warren G. Harding uh, officiated the ceremony. The soldier was awarded the Victoria Cross, which was essentially uh, reciprocation, since Pershing actually awarded the unknown warrior the Medal of Honor. And so he lays in state today. Uh, the same thing happened, the process was repeated in 1956 after President uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, recognized that there should be one for not only the World War II, but also for the Korean War. And again, they picked soldiers from all the different battlefields, um, all the different theaters of the war, and from th um, cemeteries from those wars, and decided to pick two, one from the European theater and one from the Pacific theater. And hospital in first class, and then of course, one from out of four from the Korean War. And as you can see right here is uh, the two from the two theaters of World War II and the one single one from Korea. So the hospital in first court class, uh, William Charette, he picked one of the two from World War II. And they were then, in May 28th, 1958, were again laid in state under the Capitol Dome, and on May 30th, they were awarded the Medal of Honor and laid to rest with their World War I com comrade. 30 years later, and nearly a decade after the Vietnam War, there's a lot of political pressure that there should be an unknown soldier for that conflict. But the problem was that was better medical, medical care, speedier evacuation, and better identification uh, meant that there was only four unknown soldiers after that war. Out of all the thousands and all the previous wars, there was only four. Three, two of them were subsequently identified. One was determined was not American, and the last was uh, X-26, who was found uh, in uh, lock, on lock in 1972. And he was only 3% complete, and far less than the customary 80% that deemed suitable for burial in the Tomb of Unknown. Uh, there's only three people there, so I don't understand what the costume is there. But, um, but at the time, there was no selection. Uh, so he was just picked as the one. But ceremoniously, they found Master Sergeant um, Alan J. Kellogg was the one who dedicated that, that body aboard, again, as a tradition, the U.S. as uh, Breton and taken to the U.S. So usually, the, and then uh, he was uh, interred in uh, May 28, 1984, with uh, President Reagan uh, residing. So the tomb itself, the tomb itself in 1921 was built, so it's, first of all, it's, it's actually in the Arlington Memorial Amphitheater, which serves as kind of an exhibit hall and a non-sectarian chapter, and it was dedicated in May 1928, so it's very large. Uh, in 1921, the tomb was built with three levels and did not actually have that superstructure that we know today. And in 1926, Congress actually um, uh, uh, authorized the spending for uh, that the, the uh, monument that was put on top. And uh, interesting enough, it was actually made out of uh, Yule marble that was quarried from Marble, uh, Colorado, and it weighed about 56 tons, and they transferred it to uh, here. So this is Armistice Day, 1932. So what's interesting about this is, uh, this is the picture of the tomb. This is where the World War I soldier is buried. Um, it has a lot of symbology on it that's kind of changed. One of the things I thought it was kind of funny was the fact that it changed over time. So originally the three, uh, the three uh, uh, sculptures in front, there's the three men. One is victory, one is, um, represents, uh, thank you, uh, a peace, victory, and American manhood. Uh, that seemed to be a little on PC, so they changed it to valor. Um, so the three, the three light and state with the, uh, the World War II one lies with uh, 
both the, all three soldiers. But what's really interesting about this is, I'm gonna go through, uh, since I'm running out of time, Screech, unknown is known. Uh, what's really interesting is in 1994, Ted Sampley, uh, researched the fact that the, the Vietnam soldier actually might be known. And he wrote a, he, after studying all this, he found out that there was a plane crash that, that crashed in Ann Lock in 1972. And he wrote this and con contacted uh, Patricia Blasi. Well, taking this information, and later in 1997, Vince Gonzalez of CBS News also did his, read that article, did his research on this. And, and through a lot of FOA, or Freedom of Information Act, requests actually proved Sampley, proved Sampley's thesis was true and ended up working with Patricia Blasi in 1998. They went public with the news and basically demanded the United States uh, exhume and test the DNA. What they found was that the uh, United States government, because of the political pressure of um, needing an unknown soldier, decided to uh, basically shut down any information about X-26. But after pressure, they got the DNA test and basically they found it was First Lieutenant Michael Joseph Blasi, who was Patricia's brother. Uh, it seems somewhere between being identified and cataloged in Saigon, an identification center in Hawaii, his ID went missing and just like that, he was X-26. And because of pressure to have Vietnam on a soldier for an information, the identity was suppressed. So in 1998, his body was disinterred from Arlington and was buried with full Air Force honors in St. Louis. So, now today, rather than saying Vietnam and the unknown soldier, is honoring and keeping faith with America's missing servicemen with the dates of the war, which is 1958 to 1972. So, a toast to honor those only known unto God, and may there never be another. Cheers. Hi, back to my height, and it's going to go right back up. Thank you. Whoa. There we go. Are we on? Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. And our next speaker, also for the first time on our stage, so excited. Please help me welcome Taylor Knight, who's going to talk to us about finding X, the unknown variable of math and science. Yeah. 